Hello, good morning. It's great to see you all. How is everyone doing? Okay? Good, cool. Uh, we are going to look at a passage in the Bible, uh, Matthew chapter 26. We are going to start at verse 31, and it will come up on the screen so you can follow along. It says, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And we're going to jump forward now to verse 69. It continues, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The title of this talk is How to Overcome Failure. I am a city girl, like through and through. I grew up on a council estate the other side of London. I remember uh, paying 40p to get on a London bus and get to school. I think that Nottingham is like really far in the north. And I think that Hyde Park is the countryside. And I know this about myself. But every now and then, uh, when I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed or stressed or I've just had a long couple of weeks, I look around and I see what other people are doing and I think, okay, well, often when people are stressed, they feel a bit overwhelmed by the buzz of London and they decide to flee to the countryside. And I start thinking in my head, maybe the countryside isn't that bad. And this happened a few months ago. I'd had a long couple of weeks and I thought, I know just the thing I need. And so I packed up my car and my stuff and I drove to a friend's house and they live in Norfolk. Like, this is proper countryside, like middle of nowhere, nothing around. Uh, and I thought this will be perfect. And so I went with no agenda really other than to just rest and to take some time out. I decided that part of that would be that I'd like sleep a bit more than normal and so I didn't set an alarm and I was set up in this beautiful bedroom and I went to sleep and it, it all kind of went to plan until I was woken up really abruptly at sunrise by what sounded like some birds having a fight. I had like never heard the noise before. I'm not going to do an impression because I've tried it and it doesn't sound at all uh, like a rooster, but that's what it was. It was cockerels outside in the morning and it really surprised me, uh, but it didn't surprise my like countryside friends because uh, they are really used to it because it happens most mornings at sunrise. And the interesting thing is that in this story, even in the kind of prediction of this story, we hear about this crow of the cockerel, it shows a new thing. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. In life, we get so many opportunities to prove ourselves or to blow it. We live in a world where failure is ridiculed, whether that's not quite hitting the mark on something we've worked quite hard on, or whether it's like the failure of sin and messing up. That's what Peter does here in this story. And these sorts of mistakes, these failures, if you like, are ridiculed or put on a platform. The news is full of headlines about social failures, economic failures, moral failures, political failures, even people's personal failures. And even if we haven't failed yet, it feels like all of us struggle with this fear of failure, even just occasionally. 
Because we see this identification of failure as a moment to bring about guilt and shame, to feel bad about ourselves. And in these verses, we read that immediately after Peter disowns Jesus, immediately after this moment of failure, a rooster crows. This indicates dawn, a new thing, the end of darkness and the announcement of light, new hope rather than the onset of guilt and shame. Perhaps you're here today or you're watching online and failure feels like heavy on your mind and in your heart at the moment. We prayed earlier for the students who've received their A-level results or might be awaiting their GCSE results this week. Maybe you're here and you're waiting to hear about a job or a promotion. Maybe you're facing a failed relationship or you just feel like you're letting other people or God down. The narrative of Peter's life, even the mention of the cockerel, shows us that we believe in a God who can see past the event of our failure. For Peter in this story, he's asked to testify to knowing Jesus and he fails, he denies him. Peter shows us that when we mess up, we can go into freedom or we can go into shame. It's possible to go into freedom. So how how can we overcome failure? If we know it's possible, what can we put in place in our life so that when we fail, which we inevitably will, so that it doesn't cripple us? Today, I'd love to suggest three things that I think Peter models to us. The first is to be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Jesus and Peter are friends. Throughout the New Testament, we read loads of stories of Peter's life, of his faith, of his friendship with Jesus. We read about him walking on water, making confessions about who Jesus is. And Peter, earlier in the book of Matthew, is asked to be one of Jesus' disciples one of the 12, but he's not even just one of the 12. He ends up being one of the three with James and John. Peter is in Jesus's inner circle. He's one of his closest friends. And when we look at the story of Peter's life, the standout thing, I think, is his intimacy and his closeness and his proximity to his friend, Jesus. This closeness with Jesus meant that Peter was present at huge milestone world events. He saw things that only a few people got to see. He saw the transfiguration of Jesus. So Jesus wasn't just impressed by Peter from afar. He didn't see this like glowing example of Peter. Jesus knew Peter intimately. He knew all of his strengths. He knew all of his flaws. And yet Jesus calls Peter again and again and again to be with him. And the good news is that we too are described as Jesus' friends. He knows us, but even more than that, he loves us. This is the lens through which we can see ourselves, our successes, our failures. And this is the springboard from which we get to live the whole of our lives. Jesus knows you and he loves you. And I love this quote by Omri Nouwen, which says, if you feel loved, you can do a thousand things. But if you feel rejected, everything becomes a problem. If you feel loved, you can do a thousand things. You can do everything that God is calling you to do with confidence and assurance, if you feel loved. And maybe you've come in today and you don't feel like you know that God loves you. Or maybe you know in your head that God loves you, but you haven't experienced it in your heart. We have an opportunity today. We're going to pray together later. And and what we do in those times is we invite the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the way that we experience this love that God has for us. And so I wonder if you've welcomed the Holy Spirit into your heart But even more than that, do you continue to invite the Holy Spirit again and again to come and fill you on the days where you feel overwhelmed or when you feel like you've failed or where you feel like you've let others down? The Holy Spirit reveals God's love to us and whatever you're doing, whatever you're facing today, the invitation is to experience his love through an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And it is an empowering invitation It's an invitation that has the possibility of changing the way that we walk. I love this quote of Max Licardo's. He wrote an amazing book called Facing Your Giants. And he says this, two types of thoughts continually vie for your attention. 
One says, yes, you can. The other says, no, you can't. One says, God will help you. The other lies, God has left you. One, I love this bit, one speaks the language of heaven. The other deceives. One proclaims God's strengths. The other lists your failures. One longs to build you up. The other seeks to tear you down. And here's the great news. You select the voice you hear. He says this, why listen to the mockers? when you can, with the very same ear, listen to the voice of God. When we listen to the voice of God, when we are reminded that he knows us and he loves us, it silences all of the other voices. It silences the opinions that we have about ourselves, our successes and our failures. It silences the opinions that other people have about whether we've been successful or whether we've failed those thoughts, those opinions that can cripple us and paralyze us. We need to hear the voice of God, God who knows you and loves you. So be with Jesus. The second is to try your best. I spent a few months working on a Greek island called Samos. Um, I went out as part of a big team and we were all hired to do different jobs. Uh, I was hired to do some work with the students and young people and there was a whole team hired to run the waterfront. And that meant their job day to day was basically taking out guests who were coming to this island, taking them out paddle boarding and kayaking and sailing. It was like the dream job apart from my current job in case my boss is listening. Um, and that was kind of how they spent their days. And I'm not from a, a kind of like water sports background. Like it's, it's not really what we did. So I'd never sailed before. And a few weeks into this season, I thought oh, maybe, like, maybe I should take the opportunity whilst I'm here, I should learn to sail. And part of the deal was that the waterfront team, whenever there were no guests around, you could do whatever. You could like give each other lessons, go out on the equipment, that was fine. But the condition of it was that the minute a guest arrived, you were to drop everything and give them your full attention. And so one of my friends very kindly agreed to give me a sailing lesson. And he took me up to this, uh, I think it's called a Pico. Someone, someone may know better than me. A Pico, like a tiny sailing boat. And he takes me up to it and starts kind of showing me the different ropes and explaining that they've got different colours and they do different things. And here's what you should do with this rope if this happens and et cetera, et cetera. I must have given the impression that I was really listening uh, because after about three or four minutes, a guest arrived and my friend said, oh, uh, end of the lesson, but you know what? I think you know enough, so you go for it and just know that we're here. So if you need some help, we'll be in the waterfront. You'll be fine in your Pico. And so he sends me out to sea in this boat and it becomes quite obvious quite quickly that I really have no idea what I'm doing. It gets choppier and choppier and windier and windier and I really quickly lose control of the boat. And if you can picture the scene, it's kind of like total wipeout, if you've seen that. Um, I'm wearing my little helmet and the beam, again, this is not technical language, there's like a beam that hangs off the mast and it just starts spinning. And I think like, okay, I've got a tactic, I'm just going to duck like every time it comes around. And I couldn't move quickly enough to defend myself from the boat. So after like a few moments of just trying to duck and being whacked in the face a few times, I thought, this isn't working, I need to change tactic. And so I decided that the only logical thing that I could do was to like lie like a pencil on the floor of the boat and just let the thing spin. And so my, my poor friends on the, on the waterfront just saw this boat going, going in circles. And eventually, I heard the engine of a motorboat coming close to me. And in my moment of panic and fear, I just heard my friend shout to me, what are you doing? And all I could think to say as I was stressed, wound up panicking just a tiny bit, uh, a little bit wet from the sea, all I could think to say was, I'm trying my best. And it was quite obvious that I was not trying my best. I had totally given up and I was letting whatever was happening to that boat happen to me. It, it was done. Even if you might fail, your best is enough. The world has big expectations on us, doesn't it? And I don't know about you, but it doesn't always feel like the world is for us. Jesus is the person who knows all of your potential 
He has you at your best in his mind all the time. He's constantly encouraging you, championing you, wanting to help you get there. He has a vision of what your life can be. But all he really wants is your heart. He wants you to try your best. The world has created these notions of success or failure. Even in in this story, it says Peter denied Jesus. It says Peter wept. It doesn't say in big, bold letters, Peter was a failure. It gives us the facts of the event, but it doesn't force this failure narrative on Peter's life. And even when I read the Bible, what I see is that it doesn't speak that much about success or failure. It doesn't really exist. What it talks about is obedience rather than disobedience, or showing up when you could have not showed up, or seeking one thing over another. Our primary calling is to be obedient followers of Jesus. We are commanded to have courage and to be bold in the way that we follow him. But we have permission to fail. And we could even go so far as to say that there is this prophetic voice in the Bible which tells us you might fail. The message of the gospel is that you will fall short and you need Jesus. You will fall short and you will need Jesus. When we think about failure in the context of our lives or of Peter's, there are different types of failures. There's the working really hard at something and not quite getting it right. Or there's the the failure of sin, of just mucking up and getting things wrong. And we see here this example of Peter getting caught up in this spiral of sin. When Jesus warns Peter what is about to happen... It's unlikely that Peter woke up in the morning and thought, ah, well, I I said I wouldn't deny you, but actually, feeling like causing a bit of trouble this morning, I might. I think he genuinely believed it when he said that he wouldn't deny Jesus. I think he was making this promise that he would try his best. But then we see Peter mucking up in Gethsemane three times, falling asleep, And then he, I mean, he probably starts to get quite stressed about the arrest. And then he quietly denies Jesus. And then next time it escalates a bit because he denies Jesus with an oath. And then it escalates more and more and more. And what we see is Peter going wild. It says he began to call down curses and swore to them. Peter's failure started with something really small. And then it grew. And that's what happens with this spiral of sin. Can I challenge you today? Are there areas in your life, even really, really, really small areas, where you know that you're not trying your best? Maybe you've let a thought process take over. Or maybe you've let a bad habit back in. Or maybe you know that you've not been the best spouse or friend or child. Maybe you're feeling a bit bitter or you just know that you didn't work at something quite as hard as you could have done. I find that September is a great time to reset my life, to reevaluate all of the New Year's resolutions that I made back in January and haven't stuck to. September is a really good time to evaluate where we're at, but you don't have to wait until September. You can do it right now. Ask Jesus, how can I try my best in my life with you? We're called to live courageous, set-apart lives. And I think perhaps the moment Peter went wrong was when he was overconfident in his own strength and his own ability, and if he forgot that he would need Jesus. The help that Jesus offered to him is the same help that Jesus offers to us. So we can try our best. And finally, we can experience grace. I don't know about you, but I am really forgetful, like really, really forgetful. Um, And one of the things that always catches me out just a tiny bit is I don't understand the system, but coffee shops where you go up to the counter to order your iced almond latte, then you sit down to drink your drink, and then you're meant to go back to the counter to pay before you leave. 
And what happens so often is I stand up after drinking my coffee and I walk home. And I get home and I realise I've not paid for my coffee. This happens probably, I don't know, I'm embarrassed, maybe like a couple of times a month. Um, and this happened recently with some friends. We racked up this bill of about £60, pounds, um, getting lunch and drinking coffee. And all four of us got up, walked home, and a few hours later, one of my friends says, ah, we never paid for that meal. Is this a safe space? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Nobody said yes. <laughs> I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, every time this happens, I have this thought process. This is the bad bit. Where I'm like, they're quite a big company. <laughs> they didn't notice. I don't think it's going to matter too much if I don't go back. And then I have like the, the other part of my brain that's like, you're a terrible person. You need to go back and pay for your lunch right now. Um, and it feels like this dilemma, but I was thankfully surrounded by some friends who are much better people than me. And so my friend said, we absolutely have to go back. Obviously, we're going back to pay. So we make our way back down to this cafe. And um, as we get our cards out to pay, uh, the lady looks at us and says, ah, you came back. You were honest. Don't worry about it. It's on the house. And I was blown away. But the only reason I got to experience that moment of grace, that moment of generous grace, was because I'd already had the moment of acknowledging that I had done something wrong. I had the moment of acknowledging the failing, and that was what unlocked the potential to experience this moment of grace. If anyone has ever fully understood God's grace, his goodness to give us second and third chances, it was Peter. Peter knew Jesus. He had first-hand experience of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. He didn't just know this once. He knew it again and again and again. Dane Ortland says this, it's one thing to believe that God has put away and forgiven all our old failures that occurred before new birth or becoming a Christian. That is a wonder of mercy, unspeakably rich, but those were, after all, sins committed while we were still in the dark. We had not been made new creatures, freshly empowered to walk in the light and honour the Lord with our lives. <clears throat> it's another thing to believe that God continues just as freely to put away all of our present failures. We might know that God loves us. We might think that we know that God loves us. But if we were to actually examine the way that we relate to God moment by moment, we could believe that it's this love kind of infected with disappointment. Dane Ortland gives this image of God looking down on us with this kind of paternal affection, but with slightly raised eyebrows, asking, how are they still getting it wrong? I've done so much for them. And he says that this isn't, God's love to us. This is us projecting our capacity to love onto God. Throughout the whole narrative of Peter's life, of all that is recorded in the New Testament, we learn that failure isn't a state of being. We see moments of courage in Peter's life, but I think perhaps the most courageous thing Peter does, some of the most courageous things he does are in the moments where he acknowledges that he's got stuff wrong. I love the image of him failing and denying Jesus and his response to go outside and to weep. He has this moment of realising that he has messed up, that he needs Jesus and he's got it wrong. And it's in those moments of conviction that we realise the depths of God's grace to us. And Peter responds to this grace. He goes on to live this amazingly fruitful life, not defined by failure. In the book of Mark, he is described as a seed sown on good soil, producing an immense crop of righteousness. We have the choice when we fail to go into shame or to go into freedom. We have to choose to genuinely receive it in our hearts it's so easy to know that God loves us, but to still wonder about those raised eyebrows. Jesus extends his grace again and again and again. And so in these moments, perhaps the biggest danger is ourselves, our own guilt and shame. 
Henri Nouwen says, self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Jesus is always our most faithful friend. He promises to restore our strength and courage. And he remains our faithful friend even when we become fearful failures. So what would it look like for us as a church, for us as individuals, if in the moment that we realised our sin and our failures and the way that's, ways that we muck up, if that was not the moment that darkness overwhelmed, but was the moment that the light broke into the darkness, the moment that our failures lost the power that they hold over our lives, past and future. We want to be people who are marked by our courage and so we can't afford to live as though we're really scared of failing. How can we make sure that failure doesn't cripple us? We can be with Jesus, we can try our best and we can experience grace. We're going to pray now. So can I invite you to stand?